we're going to get started. It's just about noon. Um, so my name is Jenny Mae Sampson. I am a fifth year uh, cancer bio uh, PhD candidate, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Molly Kulitz Martin, who is visiting us from OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Um, Dr. Kulitz Martin received her undergraduate degree from St. Bonaventure University in New York, then received her MS and PhD from the State University of New York in Buffalo under William McLimmons. Um, she then went on to do her postdoc at NCI with Stuart Yispa, studying skin carcinogenesis. Uh, she then started her lab at uh, SUNY at Buffalo, moving up the ranks uh, to full professor in molecular pharmacology and establishing her career in the P53 field before moving out to the Pacific Northwest in 1999 as a professor in cell developmental and cancer biology at Oregon Health Sciences University. She is now associate chair and director of research at, um, in the Department of Dermatology, where she has continued to do work in molecular carcinogenesis and in looking for novel targetable pathways for both skin and oral cancers. Please help me welcome Dr. Kulitz Martin. Thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate the welcome for all the students. I'm a training program director at OHSU, so I really understand how important it is to have students and established investigators together in multiple forums. So uh, I appreciate everybody getting me around on time and the wonderful weather you're having, which is actually not that different from Portland right now. We've, we're becoming Northern California in our weather. In any case, Today, I want to talk to you about a project that's been going on between myself and Shannon McWheeney, who's a statistical geneticist and bioinformaticist at OHSU. Shannon was tapped to help with the Biden now White House moonshot project, and she's still on the committees that advise the NIH on data sharing. So what I want to talk to you about today is to introduce you to some of the bioinformatics tools that uh, we're developing from our group or using at our group that are applicable across cancer types to tell you a story about uh, how we're con connecting function and genomics and how a graduate student of mine uh, found that through functional assessment of patient-derived cells, she discovered a new possible combination therapy and a potential mechanism for how it may be working. And it's one that you wouldn't have, she wouldn't have found if she'd only looked at the genetics and the genomics characterization of the tumors. And then lastly, I want to tell you about a project on advanced stage cutaneous SCC that we are actually starting to combine the wealth of bioinformatics uh, and uh, uh, computational and genomics data on, some, on these cases with the patient re cells response to drugs so we can add the functional piece. So that we're gaining more and more big data where we can characterize individual patients' uh, tumors. But we're still finding thousands of mutations or hundreds of genes. And it's really uh, the challenge to bring together the genetic information with what impact that has on the biology of the tumor and on the tumor response to therapy. So our group has uh, an approach to try to fill this gap and to bring the functional piece together with the genomics evaluations. Our goals are to repurpose drugs to uh, tumors that either have had no FDA-approved drugs or have only recently got FDA-approved drugs, uh, and that is head and neck cancer and skin cancer, uh, and to prioritize uh, pathways that are impactful in these tumors that for future drug development where we don't have any drug that targets anything in that pathway at this time. So I want to tell you about the cancer targetome, about some evidence-based tools to, ex to use in uh, development and discovery for precision medicine, and adding the functional piece using patient-derived tumor cells and panels to expose them and understand what drugs they may respond to, and then try to connect that to the genetic characteristics. So we are uh, learning from leukemia. We're walking in the steps of leukemia. Uh, Brian Drucker uh, advanced the paradigm that cancer causes make the best targets, and Gleevec or imatinib was the drug that was used in CML, and it took patients who were ill and couldn't work, and within three weeks they were feeling better, 
and they were able to go back to work. So it was a tremendous stride forward for the idea that if you understand something about the biology of the tumor, you can find a drug uh, that might be useful in that patient. So what the um, BEAT AML has done is collect 1,000 leukemias, and they have characterized them by uh, the uh, chart data, so a really deep dive in the clinical record. And then for discovery and diagnosis and molecular characterization, uh, whole exome sequencing, uh, RNA-seq to look at expression of genes, and, and then in addition, taking bone marrow or circulating tumor cells from the patients with leukemia and subjecting them to uh, panels of either small uh, uh, siRNAs to about 100 different targets or to 120 drugs that uh, had not yet been tested in leukemia. And then they're bringing these to what Shannon has done in her group uh, is to develop a, uh, a, an algorithm and software tool that, uh, that is expandable to all different kinds of data. And you can use um, your genomics, epigenomics uh, data, and functional data and, uh, and look at that to try to prioritize the impactful pathways in a given patient or in a given patient's cells and then select a drug treatment based on some of those analyses, and then go back and treat the patient. And they have gone back and treated patients, and, and that is our goal with head and neck and skin. So in particular, um, we started out looking at the large database of the Cancer Genome Atlas. They have 528 cases of head and neck cancer, and uh, we mined those for uh, targetable pathways. And then uh, we decided to uh, classify them with the concept that there are pathways that are targetable now with drugs on the panel, and there are pathways that are not targeted now. There's no drug that targets any protein in that pathway. And we called them, respectively, the light pathways and the dark pathways. So hence my title. What we're trying to do is illuminate uh, targetable pathways in these cancers by uh, repurposing drugs that are known or have been used in some other cancer but also by bringing in drugs maybe from other fields or maybe that need to be de novo developed in order to target some of these pathways. And then, uh, of course, adding uh, the panels and the functional screens, uh, eventually putting it all together for a prioritization of pathways and then understanding what drugs might be available for them. So... Uh, The cancer targetome was the idea that the Achilles heel of precision medicine is that uh, all of the drugs that are targeting a presumed target really have uh, up to hundreds of targets. And so the idea was, can we categorize them by existing evidence so we can apply a weight or a um, computational uh, uh, tiering that tells us just how well we know that that is a target and what are the other secondary targets and in what order do they show up for that particular drug and that particular target. So um, what Rory Blucher, who a, 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 just got her PhD in our group with Shannon, uh, did was to annotate and, and look at the evidence for the FDA-approved cancer drugs. And she looked at existing databases. Um, and if the level of evidence was from databases only, it was given a level of one. If it was from databases and the literature, it was given a level of two. And then in addition to that, we called it a level three if it was active at less than 100 nanomolar. And the idea was that if it's active at lower doses, it's most likely to be achievable in patients and, and useful. And so that was the basis of the characterization. So in head and neck cancer, we see pathways that are dark. There is no drug. We see pathways that are light. There's a drug, but the levels of evidence really reduces our armamentarium if you look for just high levels of evidence. So the, cancer, the targetome has now been integrated with reactome. So if you go to the reactome functional in, uh, integration viz app, uh, you can see Rory's uh, annotations and you can see the pathways, for example, for uh, imatinib, and you can see the targets, 
And you can go through the evidence and see the source of evidence and what the evidence was. Was it an effective dose 50? Was it an IC50? Was it a KD, a KI? And in addition, you can look at what other pathways that drug targets. So uh, this might help in deciding uh, about potential side effects uh, or toxicities for off-target effects. So that, that's available now through React Home. Uh, another project by one of the students in our group uh, uh, is uh, that of uh, Gabby Chunu. And what she did was she looked at the Cancer Genome Atlas data for the uh, head and neck patients. And um, as you know, the Cancer Genome Atlas was a major effort of NCI uh, that brought in tumor samples. They aimed for 500 tumor samples for 33 different tumor types. So what Gabby did was she looked at the head and neck data, and out of uh, 508 patients that, uh, that the evidence was good that she could evaluate, she found 159 light pathways and 232 dark pathways. So first of all, it tells you that there's a heck of a lot of pathways that are impactful and uh, potentially impactful in head and neck cancer. And that's a big opportunity for a uh, cancer that has... Uh, only one molecular targeted intrinsic therapy, and that's the EGF receptor inhibitor. And of course, we know that cetuximab is effective in maybe 10% of patients, and all patient, uh, the drug fails all patients eventually. Uh, so, and in addition, there's really no predictors of which patients will benefit from cetuximab, and it has its toxicities. So people who are treated with cetuximab, 90% of them aren't going to be benefiting, and yet they'll have these side effects that affects uh, it, it, can enact, it can activate pain, it uh, can uh, lead to loss of uh, uh, taste, sensation, and, and there are, uh, you know, side effects that we could be avoided if you knew. So what Gabby's uh, done, so first of all, there are more dark pathways than light. And second of all, Gabby's made a tool, which is uh, a shiny app. And so when this paper's published, which we hope will be uh, within the early part of the next year, you'll be able to go in, and if you want to look for your favorite pathway, you can search on it. So she's taking TCGA data, so those are genes and variants, and putting it in the pathway context. So uh, some of these uh, light pathways, they have a drug that targets the pathway, but not necessarily a drug that targets the, the chief high variant that seems to be driving it. So that's useful to know in the pathway context. And um, it allows to do a slide to say, I want to look at uh, the pathway that's important in 30% of the patients. And I want to look at a pathway that isn't a huge pathway. You have 200 genes, it's got 10 genes. Or, um, uh, or and she's also ranked it according to these different parameters. And you'll be able to look at um, which genes are in the pathway just as a convenience uh, without having to cut and paste into Reactome. And you'll be able to see how many drugs target any of the genes and any of the proteins in that pathway. And she's going to add which drugs they are. And the other thing that she's done is she's made this um, so that you could separately look at HPV positive and HPV negative. So as you know, HPV positive head and neck cancers have been increasing over time. And where we used to say maybe 25% might be HPV positive, Jennifer Grandis just said at a talk at OHSU yesterday that 70% of the head and neck cancers that they see in their clinic at UCSF are HPV positive. So it's becoming more and more of a, uh, importance to really know which category you're looking at because the HPV positive are considered to have a better prognosis. But if there's a recurrence, both HPV positive and HPV negative are, are just as deadly. So kudos to Gabby. She's working on that. So let me just tell you first about the story in head and neck cancer where function added a piece and made us, helped us learn something uh, that we didn't know about potential targets. And then uh, I'll go on to the cutaneous cancers. Um, the obstacles in head and neck cancer, of course, are the morbidity of current treatments and that there are a few molecular targeted therapy drugs. Uh, just more recently, uh, 2016, uh, PD-1 inhibitors, two different PD-1 inhibitors, of course. Uh, uh, so a stromal targeted therapy were approved, but still only one intrinsic targeted therapy. And um, the, the real uh, challenge is to individualize therapy because it's the context in that given patient that is probably going to have 
tremendous uh, impact on whether a patient's tumor is sensitive or resistant to a therapy. As you know, it's the sixth most common cancer worldwide. It's probably the first most common cancer in India. It's a huge public health problem, and it's a worldwide problem. As you come to um, uh, later stage patients, there's the, the really diminishing survival. So our approach was to enroll patients, derive tumors, bank tumors. Uh, we have viably frozen mints for PDX models. Uh, we use, um, uh, we drive the cells. We also rapidly freeze for RNA. Uh, we put an RNA later for RNA-seq. We rapidly freeze for DNA uh, whole exome sequencing. And, uh, and then we take the cells and grow them, put them on functional screens, and then go on to map and to validate. So the story, I'll just give you the punchline and then show a little bit of the data, is that by, functional, by adding that functional piece to the study, my, my graduate student, Xiaoming Ouyang, found out that, um, that ALK inhibitors uh, have a role, in, potentially have a role, in treatment of head and neck cancer in combination with the EGF receptor inhibitor gefitinib. So um, ALK is really mutated in 5% or less of uh, head and neck cancers, although it's a major player in lung cancer and there are fusions and other types of cancers, but they don't seem to be present in head and neck. Uh, and it wasn't significantly expressed in the TCGA cohort, 5% uh, or less, and uh, nor was it so expressed in our functionally characterized couple of dozen head and neck tumors. So um, what we do is we take the patient's tumors, we uh, use explant culture. So at the beginning of the culture, they'd have their own stroma. And then over time, we weed out the fibroblasts using differential trypsinization. We grow them in roller bottles where we can control the environment better by having a larger volume of media and yet also having good gas exchange. Uh, and then uh, we put them on the functional screens. So this is what the tumors, the original tumors look like across the top. And each of these is an individual head and neck uh, cancer from a patient. And then this shows the epithelial morphology at the time we put the uh, cells on the drug screens uh, for each of the cases. We also look to see if the tumor cells have undergone uh, uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition by looking at mesenchymal and epithelial markers uh, to verify that we have, in fact, epithelium. So these are the morphologies of the original tumor and the phase contrast of the cultured cells for the first 16 patients, and we have over 20 patients now. So those cells are then put on a, uh, a drug screen, and the drugs are in uh, starting at 10,000 nanomolar, depending on the drug, uh, in one-third dilutions for seven different dilutions so that we cover a pretty good span of, uh, for dose response to the drug. And then we use an MTS assay, which measures viability by measuring metab metabolism. And so the darker spots are uh, either the drug had no effect or it was our control wells with no drug. And then as they get lighter, it shows that there's less viability, there's fewer viable cells, and we, uh, did, we define it as an effective drug for that particular patient cells if it's uh, less than 20% of the median IC50 across all the patients. So in every case that we've tested so far, we have found a drug regimen that reduces viability of the tumor cells. Sometimes it's only two, sometimes it's 16. Um, in this case, this is a pretty resistant uh, tumor, uh, uh, patient-derived tumor cells. And there was no effective drug reaching that threshold uh, with that drug as a single agent. But when we added, and by the way, that was gefitinib, and that's what we use on the panel as a surrogate for cetuximab. It's not exactly the same mechanism, but it is an anti-EGF receptor. But when we added it in combination with gefitinib, we now found several drugs that were effective. And when Xiaoming looked at what this is showing, obviously this is not all 120 drugs. What I'm showing are the drugs that were effective in any patient or the combinations that were effective in any patient. So uh, Xiaoming found that out of the first five patients where we have the genomics as well as the functional data, that ALK inhibitor uh, plus gefitinib 
rose to the top in terms of three patients now became sensitive uh, to the drug regimen if ALK was added to an EGF receptor inhibitor. So because of the cancer targetome and because we know that the drugs have secondary targets, we also used siRNA looking at some of those secondary targets. And what you can see here is that in one of the sensitive, in one of those three sensitive cases, and we saw this in all three of the sensitive cases, that, um, is the arrow working? Okay. That, um, that without uh, gefitinib, there was no loss of viability with the sRNA to ALK. But with gefitinib, it reached the threshold of two standard deviations, uh, mean viability. And in a resistant patient, we didn't see that change. Now, what you also see is that either with or without gefitinib, those other targets were not effective in reducing the viability, suggesting that ALK was the true target. So as I mentioned, ALK is not a, considered a major variant in uh, head and neck cancer in TCGA, and we didn't see it in our RNA-seq as being very highly expressed. However, um, so for that reason, Xiaoming came up with the hypothesis that maybe gefitinib was inducing ALK. So uh, this is published, and I think the PMCV students had a journal club where they looked at the paper. But what she found was uh, she tested various time courses and uh, compared the sensitive and resistant patients. There's, there's an induction of ALK after gefitinib treatment of the patient-derived tumor cells in culture. And uh, either total, in, induction, total ALK indu protein-induced, total ALK and phosphorylation, phosphorylation of ALK-induced alone, or there was one case where there was uh, more expression of ALK protein than there had been in the other two cases. So she found one possible mechanism whereby this combination might work in head and neck cancer, uh, even though this is something that we wouldn't have noticed at all if we just looked at the genomics of these cancers. So she followed up in a system that's considered more like the in vivo situation, and that is spheroid cultures. And again, she saw that when she combined gefitinib with ALK, there was induction uh, uh, sorry, when she treated the tumor cells with ALK, there was, sorry, with gefitinib, there was induction of ALK, and that was statistically significant. So then she looked at tumor xenografts. We, uh, we uh, uh, made xenografts of, the, of this particular patient's tumor-derived cells, and whether we put it in the oral cavity or in the flank of the mice, the uh, original tumor and the tumor in the... Uh, uh, the xenograft tumor and the tumor in the mice showed a poorly differentiated and yet a, a typical epithelial morphology, and the tumors looked uh, very similar. There was a tendency toward induction of, um, of ALK after gavage treatment of the mice with gefitinib, uh, the tu mice with tumors with gefitinib, uh, but there was a significant uh, induction of ALK protein as determined by uh, immunoblotting and also by uh, indirect immunofluorescence. Now, it's already been published using a head and neck cancer cell line that the combination of gefitinib and um, an ALK inhibitor had a, uh, a stasis effect on uh, head and neck tumors. So what uh, uh, Xiaoming's work showed was that uh, there were additional ALK inhibitors that also worked uh, in this combination and that uh, this combination was effective in patient-derived head and neck tumor cells. And she discovered a potential mechanism of action for why this could be the case. So the next steps uh, will be uh, that we are pursuing in head and neck cancer is to expand the uh, in inhibitor assay. So we started with the panel that was used in leukemia. But now we have created a, a panel that takes into account the pathways that were highly impactful from TCGA data mining, the, the drugs that were effective in the first patients that we've tested so far, and then adding additional to that. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, we also want to be able to interpret the targets in light of TCGA. So we have a much smaller data set, uh, but it's a functionally characterized data set. So can we overlap that functional characterization with the genomics characterization onto TCGA and learn more about TCGA, uh, uh, from TCGA data, about adding that missing functional piece and its relevance and how big of a cohort might be impacted? And then, uh, in addition, our next step, in which we're doing now, is to integrate the functional omics using HitWalker and other types of analyses. 
So this shows the um, head and neck and skin specific panel. We, as I said, we have top drugs from PCGA, but we're starting to add um, agents that may be effective against the dark pathways. And so the way we've gone into this is to work with Steve Chamberlain, who's a member of our group, who has been uh, creating the natural product cancer targetome. So he's looking at um, uh, drugs that are, have been derived from plants and uh, or, or um, more purified compounds derived from plants for which there's some evidence that there may be effectiveness against pathways of interest. And we've been adding those also to the panel. We've also started to take the uh, uh, head and neck patient data. This is the first patient we uh, enrolled in, and tested by our drug screens and layering that back onto TCGA data. So what you can see here are the dark black circles are 20 some genes that are um, uh, mutated or overexpressed either from WES or from RNA-seq data in this particular patient's cells and in their tumor compared in RNA-seq, it's compared to uninvolved patient-matched mucosa. So we're looking at the malignant conversion genes, you would say. Uh, and uh, for um, whole exome sequencing, of course, we're comparing tumor to, to blood. But you can see that when you overlay this against this same pathway, which happens to be the focal adhesion pathway in TCGA, the red shows the extent to which that particular protein in that pathway is impacted or gene is impacted in TCGA. So obviously this pathway is one that's highly affected in head and neck cancers from TCGA data, as well as in this particular patient's tumor. So I mentioned that the tools we're, we're working with and, and, uh, and creating or providing uh, uh, will have broader reference, uh, relevance to other cancers, we believe, but we've started to look at cutaneous SCC. And uh, we're particularly interested in, in starting at the end, like the, the cutaneous SCCs that have already invaded or metastasized. And we have three patients that we're characterizing as a molecular case study. And the idea is, can we learn something about those tumors that will allow us to go back to the tumors that are seen in dermatology and say what 8% of those tumors might be the ones that it won't be cured by surgery alone and might come back? Can we have options for those patients? Can we have a test that will assess their risk so that we can follow them? Could we even think about preventive strategies? So the obstacles in cutaneous SCC are there is no TCGA for cutaneous SCC. It's considered you know, cured by surgery alone, so we don't necessarily have to worry about it. Um, currently, as I said, there's no predictive tests for um, uh, which of uh, the tumors seen in dermatology are going to be recurrent and deeply invasive and metastatic. And there's no preventive adjuvant treatment, certainly. And there were, up until uh, last month, no FDA-approved uh, drugs of any sort for uh, advanced cutaneous SCC or any cutaneous SCC. Uh, but now there's an injectable form of PD-1 inhibitor uh, for advanced disease. So starting to happen, but there's a huge need in both of these cancers that have really high mutation loads. So cutaneous cancers, it's the second most common keratinocyte cancer. Uh, it affects up to 300,000 people in the U.S. Uh, some patients have a much higher risk, like patients who have been uh, um, solid organ transplant patients who are immunosuppressed. And as I said, up to 8% uh, would come back and be this metastatic kind of deadly form. Up to 8,000 people die a year of, of cutaneous advanced SCC, and that's about the number that die of CML. So obviously it's, a, it's an important problem, and it's getting worse because uh, cutaneous SCCs are going up all the time. And it costs over $8 billion a year to public health. It's a public health burden, uh, not to mention to the individual patient. So this is the same kind of approach that I showed you for head and neck cancer, only we didn't have material for RNA-seq, so we did whole exome sequencing and the small molecule drug inhibitor uh, screen. So this shows a timeline for the, each of these three patients' disease. Uh, what you see in the triangles are where we took the surgery specimen. And what you see at zero time is where, when it was diagnosed. So for example, in this patient, the patient reported they'd seen a mass there maybe 
uh, three months before the surgery. Uh, in this patient, they were actually treated in Mohs surgery for a squamous cell carcinoma, and they were then given, they were advised and, and took uh, radiation therapy. And then they had a, a recurrence in the neck, which then was uh, deeply invasive and in the lymph node. And this is the only of the, two, of the three patients that is deceased. They tried cisplatin therapy, uh, but it wasn't effective. And then the third patient um, is alive, even after having uh, head and neck as well as skin cancer and having lung metastasis, and they were treated with nivolumab. So what this says is that within the time frame of when we get a specimen, we have 10 months or more in which having gaining information from some kind of a functional screen might be uh, useful, and that could really have a chance to circle back and have an impact on options for the patient. This shows, again, the tumor morphology for each of the three patients and the cell culture morphology of what went on the inhibitor screen. So again, I, I showed you the MTS assay, and we uh, derive IC50s. But um, Shannon, uh, we believe that the, um, that the area under the curve is probably a more robust way of looking at these data. So we generated the areas under the curve for each patient for all 100 and eight drugs that were on this, this panel. And we tested with and without gefitinib, the EGF receptor inhibitor. And these show uh, the drugs that were called in any patient as sensitive. So that patient was sensitive to the drug. So if in any patient, so this is, um, uh, and then we ranked them and the top 20% are what we're showing. So we called the, the, the ones in uh, blue, the top 20%, meaning the lowest area under the curve, uh, that, that that patient uh, was sensitive to that, that patient's tumor-derived cells were sensitive to that drug. And so some examples of sensitivity, which I know you can't read this, is uh, desatinib, and uh, desatinib is here, and uh, sunitinib, which is here. And... All three patients were sensitive to these two drugs, and I'll mention that again in a minute. But there were cases, there were uh, drugs that were sensitive that, to which one or two patients were sensitive, but not another. And one example is trematinib, uh, where two patients were sensitive to, to cells were sensitive to trematinib, but one was resistant. So this is a nice way to do the PDX model, where you can test a drug on several cases at least one sensitive, one resistant, and then choose a drug that the third case is sensitive to. And so it's a, it's a good way to compare. I like to look at the drugs that are not uniformly effective across any patient group, like our 20 or so head and neck or, or these uh, three uh, cutaneous cancers, because that's the only handle we have at this point on whether the drug might be selective. So the idea is that, uh, like, um, BI2536, that's a polo-like kinase inhibitor, and it, there uh, it was some selectivity. Again, it's only three patients, so we can't read too much into it, but these are the kinds of approaches that we're looking at. So here's an example of a few drugs. It says which uh, of the patient-derived cells were sensitive. It says what the presumed drug target is, and often we don't see a mutation in the presumed drug target but we do see damaging mutations as predicted by several um, algorithms in the pathway. So again, the importance of looking at a pathway context uh, and analyzing these data in that way as well as in individual genes. So now uh, the, the, uh, the software that allows us to... Uh, to feed in various kinds of data, including omics data of various types, as well as functional data. HitWalker is a, um, it's a robust and uh, reproducible uh, tool for precision medicine. And what it does is it, it takes all the data you feed into it, and it, um, it's an algorithm that, uh, that does a random walk through this uh, protein interaction network uh, looking for and prioritizing genes or variants. So it could be an overexpressed gene or an underexpressed gene, or it could be a mutated gene. And uh, what, what you see here is an example from leukemia where 
this shows that two different types of uh, assay were used, so a, a, a siRNA screen and a drug screen, and it shows that whether there was a mutation in the particular uh, protein, and also it compares it back to a large cohort in this case, which is not where we are yet, but it'll tell you the frequency of that mutation in the cohort and the rank of that frequency, among other genes. And then HitWalker is available, and, and one can go and, and look at favorite pathways or upload data sets uh, of various types uh, and allow you to look in a pathway context. And then uh, this, what this shows is for any given patient, these are the top HitWalker targets. And then you can look at a pathway of interest and see how they fall out with that particular pathway. So this is an example of a pathway that is um, in common to all three of these cutaneous patients. And what we asked was, where, where do we find the novel putatively pathogenic mutations that are in a pathway that's in common to all three patients? And um, we actually found such a pathway uh, the HitWalker prioritized targets are highlighted here in, in blue. And the interesting thing is this is a neutrophil degranulation pathway. And yet, you can easily find that three out of um, uh, four of these HitWalker targets are highly expressed in skin. In fact, uh, one of them, the Serpin A1, is found in every case of uh, recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. And I know that you have a, a large team studying this here. <clears throat> in addition, in this particular pathway, there were two uh, examples uh, of targets, FGR, which is a feline sarcoma virus oncogene uh, homolog, and STIC10, uh, which were uh, targeted by sinitinib and um, disatinib. So again, these aren't the chief targets, but we're looking for ways to target a potentially impactful pathway. So I've shown you that uh, so far, uh, whether we're looking at head and neck cancer patients, tumor-derived cells, or skin cancer patients, tumor-derived cells, we've, we've found a drug that's effective in reducing viability at our threshold for every case, whether it's uh, a single agent or a combination regimen. And we've been able to identify target genes and mutations that, uh, and initially prioritize them for further functional validation. Uh, what I didn't mention in the, the pathway I just showed you is that we were looking for uh, not only potentially damaging mutations, but novel mutations that hadn't been uh, reported yet. So there are other drugs that may target those pathways that are uh, in known uh, mutated genes. So. Uh, that's another uh, possibility, in addition to the dark pathways that we find and then try to find uh, uh, bringing from the dark to the light, finding drugs that then can go on the panel and then become options for potential repurposing. So in addition, we found novel mutations and novel potentially actionable targets. So um, what we, because the, the derm samples are small, we intend to characterize uh, the signature by immunohistochemistry using multiplex immunohistochemistry so we can look at up to 20 uh, different antibodies in two slides from either dermatology or head and neck. And we've created a uh, tumor microarrays with uh, 50 late-stage cutaneous deeply invasive squamous cell carcinomas and hundreds of, uh, of, case of SCCs seen in dermatology. And in addition, we've created the tissue microarrays from head and neck cancers uh, grade 4, uh, 100 versus grades 1 through 3, 100. So that's part of the validation process. Uh, PDX models in nod-skid mice are part of it. Again, we're focused on tumor intrinsic. I know this is a, a fabulous place for humanizing mice where you could actually start to query the, the stroma. And, uh, and we do think that whatever we come up with in terms of intrinsic uh, vulnerabilities, that a combination is, is something that would, could definitely be impactful in head and neck cancer and in cutaneous cancer. So eventually, maybe a dermatopathologic test that would help stratify risk for patients seen in dermatology and um, individualized treatment options for patients and even consideration of, of prevention. Uh, as I mentioned, Jennifer Grandis was talking to OHSU yesterday, and she was talking about potential prevention of recurrence in head and neck cancer. Because as you know, when people are treated, 
they go on to be most likely to die of another cancer, and it's usually lung cancer. But if you have a way to prevent that kind of progression, it could have a huge impact. And I think as we all, as many of you study skin cancer, skin is a wonderful model to understand what's happening in certain pathways. It's visual, you can see it at the early stages, you can test ideas, uh, and, uh, and these will probably have more broad impact to other cancers. So to summarize where we're headed is to use the knowledge that we gain from functional genomics approaches for setting up clinical trials. And they could be repurposing of a drug that hadn't been used in head and neck or skin cancer before. They could be combination treatments, like I introduced to you from my graduate student. And they can also help with predictive modeling. If you have a better handle on the evidence for the, the drugs and what their targets are, uh, you're going to have better predictive models. And, and of course, umbrella trials where you can span out the treatment arms. At OHSU, um, they're already, they've already started what's called serial measurement of molecular and architectural responses to therapy, or SMART trials, with two ends. And they've taken breast cancers. They've, uh, they've taken uh, the, the tissues, got imaging, functional information, uh, and uh, omics information, epigenetics information. And the idea is to have tumor boards that are, are effective for, for physicians. They can sit there, and they can get the bottom line, uh, and they can contribute to the iterative process of how we treat, uh, how we work up a patient as they come in at the molecular level. And they've started to use combinations in breast cancer, and they're starting to see some, some, uh, uh, some positive effects. So we would like to head to the SMART trials, as uh, Joe Gray and Gordon Mills are, are working on. So again, uh, congratulations to you students in PMCB. You have a big uh, possibilities of interesting careers ahead of you. Uh, Xiaoming Uyang uh, did the work on ALK. She's a uh, postdoc at Stanford now. Ashley uh, Barling uh, is an MD-PhD student at OHSU. Carolyn Hale was a community dermatologist, and being retired, she walked into the lab and said, I want to work in the lab. So she's our visiting professor is making all the tissue microarrays for the skin. Danielle McClanahan will be a resident in dermatology with us next year. And she started this whole cutaneous project as a summer medical student uh, with us when she was a University of Pittsburgh medical student. And Miles uh, Vigoda and Chase Matheson are the new kids on the block in the project. And uh, Shannon McWheeney and her huge team, uh, we meet together monthly to move this project forward. And it's probably the most fun I've had in a long time. So thank you all for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Yes. <laughs> when you look back, uh, start to break down HPV positive versus HPV negative. Um, how, how does the information described in terms of pathways play out? Because as you said, we're seeing a lot of HPV positives, but the HPV negatives are really the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of right. So we're able to break that down and put it into those buckets in relationship to what you were describing. Yeah, so um, the um, HPV positive had fewer pathways, but we have a smaller set, data set, um, which might be expected. And I remember a lot of, uh, of course, P53 related, E6, uh, you know, RB, P53. Um, so I think that uh, while radiation and, um, you know, is used uh, effectively in HPV positive cases, it it has uh, radiation and cisplatin, and they have these side effects. So if we can, if we can uh, use molecular targeted therapies that may be less toxic and have fewer side effects, it's going to have a huge impact on quality of life, whether it's HPV positive or HPV negative. So yes, we do focus more on the HPV negative cancers as they come in, but we don't turn away the HPV positive ones so that even though we have fewer of those, we do have some insight in, as to what pathways are... are um, 
are activated. Uh, I mean, the poster child is, it's an activated pathway. It's, a, it's a, a mutated gene, so we can actually do a test for it. And that, that mutation being present and active will predict the response to a drug. But we don't always have the poster child. So that's why at this point, we, we need the functional and the genomics to be combined in order to understand where we might go in a way that would help patients. So um, you're, you're absolutely right. It's the HPV negative ones that we're concerned with. But um, when they recur, it's just as deadly in both cases. So those additional changes that occur, uh, and will they be different in the HPV positive or negative? Maybe we'll be able to detect that. I think where the SMART trials really come in, and they're so much better than what we've been able to do so far, is that you get longitudinal samples from the same patient. And so you start to see what worked or what didn't work, and then what, how does the tumor change? So uh, can we keep ahead of it so that we always have another therapy? Sequential therapy is getting to be a big uh, idea now. Maybe you can't combine the therapies you'd like to combine at the same time because of toxicities, but maybe you can predict and have the next drug ready sequentially. So um, I think that even by a few cases, it's like the N of one, you know. <laughs> For that patient, it matters a lot that you figured out what you could treat them with. So that's our feeling. And yet, if we can, if we can as much as possible make the functionally characterized data set teach us something when it's overlaid to uh, TCGA, overlaid to HPV positive or negative cases, then I think we'll be further along. Yes? For your ALK EGFR um, study, like, did you look at the combination inhibitor in vivo? Did you look at your drugs? We didn't look at the combination over long term with the tumors. As I said, it was already published for cell lines, but not for these particular tumors. So it would have been nice to uh, put three sensitive tumors and, you know, the resist, more resistant tumors into mice, treat with it over time, and watch to see whether we had this impact on the tumor growth. But at that point, we felt that we wanted to move on to some potentially more impactful single agents or combination agents. And because we're providing additional preclinical evidence to the evidence that is already published about head and neck cell lines, uh, Used, using a cufitinib plus ALK, we thought that that probably might have been enough to move it to the clinic, potentially. So we wanted to move on to other things that were potentially novel, maybe have more impact in head and neck. As a matter of fact, later stage head and neck tumors do, over, do express ALK pretty highly. So what Xiaoming found really fits into what we do know about head and neck. Uh, but it just wasn't something that people think about first. They think about it in lung cancer or other tumors, but they don't think about using ALK inhibitors in head and neck. So that, I think, was a good contribution on her part. She did want to finish, too, in five years. <laughs> but that's, you know, really a... The, the real answer is, yes, it would be nice to know in the individual patients. Did it bear out like it did in the cell line? Yes. So uh, I may have missed some information, but uh, I just wonder how ALK is regulated and why mm -hmm. it is upregulated after this you know, mm -hmm. treatment. Yeah. Is it just specific to this treatment, or is it upregulated after any kind of inhibitor or well, we don't know because we didn't look at that. But I think others have published that you, when you treat with one um, cancer drug you can induce pathways that, of course, weren't there to begin with. So I think it can happen, but understanding it in a given patient and what impact it might have and whether you could now think of another therapy. I don't know how ALK is regulated in terms of the transcription factors involved or the upstream uh, events. I'm sure it's out there, but uh, I'm not recalling at the moment what that, um, what that would be. Um, Yes? I think with the data that just came out in ESMO uh, showing the, the survival advantage of pembrolizumab over chemotherapy uh, in advanced head neck cancer, I think this work 
will need to be looked at in the context of PDL1 expression mm -hmm. because patients who walk in advance and neck cancer of PDL1 expression are going to be off the pedal yeah. up front now as first line and first line occurring, mm -hmm. assuming they failed to splat. So I think absolutely so, yes. So so I think it's important to look at the models in that context. Yes. So the ones who are PDL1 negative or non-responders, how does your approach then? Mm -hmm. uh, take that into account and does it potentially flip those tumors based on what you're going to give it based on pathways yep. to more of a PL1 expressive tumor? No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, now that there is some effectiveness of uh, anti-PD-1 therapy in these, it's not going to, you're going to have to think in that context. I believe that we really need to characterize the intrinsic properties of the tumor because I think those properties drive the stromal remodeling. <laughs> in many cases, and if we understand that better, we're going to understand better who's going to respond to PD-1 and therapy, anti-therapy or not. Uh, what we've thought is, first we'll get the tumor intrinsic match up to a drug, and then the next step might be to go to microenvironment element microarrays, which Jim Korkla, um, a collaborator of mine, has, which will tell us what substratum factors in the environment or what soluble factors might impact whether that drug uh, and that patient, there's still a sensitivity to that drug or not. And if not, can we manipulate that factor to uh, then make the drug effective? So we can, we can move to the next step with that kind of in vitro assay. Uh, once we go into animal models and we want to combine with immunotherapies, we're going to need uh, to collaborate with people who understand how to make humanized mice that have the same immune system as the patient's tumor. I think that would be the ideal thing. So... I'll have to keep talking to my friends here. <laughs> but it's a really important point. Um, but I do think we still need to find out what tumor intrinsic drug to use in combination with anti-PD-1 as uh, people are trying to study and understand uh, PD-1, what cells it's on. And, um, you know, where you need to have CD8 cells there to have any effect. You know, these types of things we really need to characterize, but also not forget that if we know something about the tumor and what we could target intrinsic pathways, that we're going to be more successful. Thank you.